let's consider the structure of the seals and the trumpets, because this can offset some of the confusion we feel if we're unfamiliar with the book and uh, it feels kind of chaotic. It feels like we can't really predict it. Well, as it turns out, uh, there is a predictable pattern to these series and it has a four plus three structure. So in the seals, you'll find that the first four items go together. They make a group, the white horseman, the red horseman, the black horseman, and the green horseman. And then the next three items in the series also have a common theme. They all have to do with the martyrs of Christ in heaven. And the same thing with the trumpets. The first four make a group. They are judgments upon one third of a certain domain of creation, a third of trees, a third of the ocean, and so on. And then the next three items in the series all have to do with armies and kings and nations. Another thing that will help us to find this book uh, easier to navigate and more predictable is to understand that there are going to be two interlude visions after item number six, right? An interlude is an interruption. It's where John breaks away to look at something else for a moment. So after seal number six, we'll see the sealing of the 144,000 Israelite virgins. And then after that, we'll see the great multitude in heaven. The same thing will happen uh, after the sixth trumpet, where we have John eating the book that is given to him by the glorious angel, and the two witnesses are martyred in Jerusalem. So in both of these series, there is a four plus three structure, and in both, we can anticipate two interlude visions that interrupt the series after item number six. So how should the plague's fulfillment be understood? This is an important question, uh, and, and it's somewhat tricky, but we want to take a moment to consider it before we look at the first four plagues. Now, the first view, and I think this is the view that people tend to assume uh, whenever they first pick up the book, is that each plague is punctiliar. That is, each plague predicts a single event in history, whether in the ancient world or in the final generation, right? And this is a, a kind of assumption that people often bring to biblical prophecy. And it's, it's the notion that the prophet is sitting down and he wants to predict an event in the future. And so he writes it down and one day it's fulfilled and it's one and done, right? It will never be fulfilled ever again. And the other view, the view that I think is going to be so much more helpful, is to understand these plagues as representative. These plagues are representative of the kinds of plagues that God will send upon the earth in response to the persecution of his people. And so uh, each one of these prophecies is not so concerned with a specific event in history. It's more concerned with the patterns of history. And prophecy more broadly is often this way. For example, prophecy can be fulfilled more than once. It is not just one and done. And the example I like to use is in Zechariah 12.10, where the prophet says that they shall look upon him whom they have pierced. Well, John says that this is fulfilled at the crucifixion. Whenever uh, the Roman soldier drives his spear into Jesus' side, he then cites Zechariah 12.10 as being fulfilled. But this doesn't stop us from recognizing uh, the fulfillment of this passage again at the time of the second coming in Revelation 1 8 John says that uh, and they shall look upon him whom they have pierced they he understands this is being fulfilled again whenever Jesus appears on the clouds of heaven so these plagues likewise uh, can be fulfilled more than once in history fulfillments often carry over key features of the original prophecy but not every detail I'll give you another example having to do uh, with the crucifixion of Jesus. John cites the Passover lamb passage in Exodus 12 as having been fulfilled. And you can see why. When you look at uh, the list of common denominators between Jesus and Exodus 12, between Jesus and the lamb of Exodus 12, uh, you can see they are both killed by the assembly of Israel. They're both killed at twilight. Uh, they're not to be left until morning. A, a big deal is made of the fact that they take Jesus down off of, off of the cross uh, quickly before the arrival of the Sabbath. They're both to be eaten as a Passover meal. Uh, those who do not eat shall perish. 
there's weeping for the firstborn. And the line that John cites, uh, not all of his bones, his, his bones were not broken as uh, the other criminals on the cross were. But you don't want to say, because Jesus fulfills this passage in Exodus 12, that all of the aspects of Exodus 12 apply to Jesus. For example, Jesus was outside. He was not inside as was prescribed by the text in Exodus. He's not a year old. Uh, his blood is not put on doorposts. His body was not burned. Uh, you don't have to consume him while standing. And uncircumcised slaves and foreigners uh, can participate in the Passover meal that is Jesus. They're not barred from participation as in Exodus 12. And so we'll find when we look at prophecy and then when we look at historical fulfillment, that historical fulfillment is often an approximation of what the prophet said. It, there's often a striking likeness, enough that you can cite it as fulfillment, but you don't necessarily have to require that every fulfillment has every single aspect of the prophecy. Uh, this is not the way this usually works whenever a New Testament writer cites an Old Testament passage as being fulfilled. It's just that key features of that Old Testament prophecy have been fulfilled, not necessarily every single detail. An example of how not to read this. And uh, I'm going to use the example that comes from the most popular end time ministry in the United States. It's called End Time Ministry. And uh, the guy who founded it is uh, Irvin Baxter. And this is how he works out the four horsemen. He says, the white horse it represents false Christianity. And so here he takes a swipe at the Pope because he's always wearing white, white and he drives you know a pope mobile and all that and then red this is against socialism and communism because this color is associated with them and then black is associated with capitalism think of uh black friday for example and then green death is islam because green is a prominent color in islam now there are problems right first of all these colors have meanings throughout the rest of the book that aren't like this. So white throughout the rest of the book is a color of legitimate heavenly holiness and uh, the color of conquest. It's not a. It's not the color of false religion. Uh, red is a color of violence. Black is not the color of the market. It's the color of mourning. And uh, we'll we'll talk about green here in a moment. But the big problem here is he fails to understand the causal relationship between these seals. So item one causes item two. Item two causes item three. It's, it's a causal chain effect. And in no way could it make sense to say that Catholicism causes socialism, socialism caused capitalism, and capitalism caused Islam. So, so the, 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 there are two types of readers of the book of Revelation. People who come and try to learn the text based on what these things mean in biblical symbolism and imagery and how ancient people would have understood uh, these images and symbols with which they were so familiar. And then there's the person who has strong political opinions and he just kind of imposes them on every symbol and every image things that he gathers from his world this this is what this person has done and of course people like it right because well we just took a shot at the catholics we just took a shot at islam i love it you know uh but th this is this is this is not a wise way to handle the book so let's talk about the horseman the white horseman goes out first he goes out to conquer he's wearing a crown and he has a bow in his hand. Now, uh, interpreters, as far back as we have interpreters on the book of Revelation, have debated this question. Is the four, first horseman Christ? Uh, one of our oldest commentaries on the book of Revelation, Ocumenia, Ocumenius in the 6th century, said the white horse is a symbol of the gospel. Andrew of Caesarea, same century, says, you know, we understand the loosing of the first seal to signify the generation of the apostles. And Victorinus, our oldest surviving commentary on Revelation from about the year 270, he does the same thing. And he says, the crown on the head is promised to preachers by the Holy Spirit. Well, 
most modern scholars uh, do not do this. Why do they not do this? Well, there are differences between the way Christ is presented and the way this horseman is presented. Uh, Christ is presented in chapter 19, where it says he's on a white horse, and he who sat on it is called faithful and true, and in righteousness he judges and makes war. Well, Christ carries a sword. This horseman carries a bow. Christ wears many crowns when he appears on his white horse, and this guy only wears one. Maybe the differences are significant. Too awkward and reductionistic for Christ to be reduced to only one of four horsemen. Christ is this big deal. He's transformed cosmic worship. He has the book in his hand, and he starts to break the seals, and he's only one of them. And the, and the four horsemen are a group, and therefore the implication is they're kind of on a par with one another, and Christ has been reduced to just being one of four. Like, just a little bit awkward. You would expect uh, if one of these is Jesus, you know, it, it, he wouldn't just be one in a group, and, and that his compadres would be things like famine. Uh, so, so probably not right. More likely, it's a demonic parody of who Jesus is, this conqueror. Uh, we find that this is the logical backbone of the demonic in Revelation in chapter 13, when we start talking about governmental authorities, uh, when we start talking about the beast. Jesus died a violent death, so the beast will die a violent death. Jesus is, rises from the dead, so the beast rises from the dead. Jesus ascends to heaven to take up his throne. And the beast ascends out of the bottomless pit so that he can reign upon the earth. So the, the whole demonic program in Revelation is a matter of parody. It's a matter of copycat, right? They're always copying Jesus. Well, that's probably what's going on here. The uh, military conquerors of the world are ultimately... Uh, failed emulations of Christ. They're, you know, they're stomping around on God's world like they own the place, uh, but they're just parodies of the real thing. White is the color of conquest. The Romans and the Parthians, after they would have a, a military victory, they would come back into their cities and they would dress in white and they would take this big victory walk, this victory procession. And we know this logic is present in Revelation because you remember back in Revelation 3, 4, when Jesus is talking to the folks at Sardis, he says, he who overcomes will walk with me in white. Why walking and why in white? Because he's talking about one of these victory processions. And so this is not the color of false Christianity here. This is the color of conquest. And people in the ancient world would know this. The bow corresponds to the far-reaching geographical range of a great conqueror. Think of great conquerors like Alexander the Great or like Napoleon or whoever. The idea is to go out and grab as much territory as quickly as you can. And that's why the bow is a good symbol here because it's, it's far-reaching. Are we assuming he's got an arrow in his quiver? <laughs> I'm willing to make that assumption. Yeah. I have a question. Yes, ma'am. Everything I've ever read about Revelation, they always try to put everything in this into our time frame. Mm -hmm. Instead of, but this is actually saying, no, you really need to look back to what was what was current then and, and what those symbolisms mean then and not necessarily try to interpret it into today's world. Yeah, I mean, I think that, that as, as prophecy usually uh, works, you look at the first fulfillment in the ancient audiences period. And all additional fulfillments, including into the modern period, build on top of that, right? You, so, so it gives you kind of a, a set of controls for how you interpret. If I understand how this works in the ancient world, then I will have the prophetic eyes to understand how it will work in my world. I mean, we don't want to make the mistake, like the strong preterist mistake, of thinking all this was fulfilled in the ancient world and it does not continue to be fulfilled because we're going to find so much of this stuff was not fulfilled in the ancient world, not in any sense. Uh, and, and at the same time, you know, we've seen what a mistake it is to think this is all about the future and not about the ancient world. That's the mistake most people make when they read Revelation. And we're going to tear that down our whole way through this book. Because symbolism. Right, right. There are going to be so many references to, to Rome, to the emperor cult 
to so many things in the ancient world uh, that it's not possible to ignore the ancient context and still be responsible. So yes, you start with the ancient context to understand these symbols, uh, and, and, and then from there, you move forward in history and you start to think about the generation of the second coming. He's carrying a bow and he's on a horse. Well, if you're in this the ancient Roman Empire, this is a scary image for you. you know, Roman soldiers didn't do this, right? They, they have no cavalry archers in the Roman army. Uh, the Roman army wasn't big on shooting arrows, uh, but their, their enemies did. The Parthians had defeated the Romans in battle three times. This is the biggest contender. They're to the east. Think like an Iranian empire. And then they have enemies along the northern uh, boundaries who also have these cavalry archers. So uh, the Roman Empire is persecuting Christianity at the time that Revelation is written. And this looks like a threatening image toward them, a threat that their territory could in fact be conquered. When he opened the second seal, I heard the second living creature say, come. And out came another horse, bright red. Its rider was permitted to take peace from the earth so that people should slay one another. And he was given a great sword. Red is the color of war and bloodshed. Uh, we could give other examples, but I'll just look at one. The great red dragon that appears in Revelation 12. Well, what does he immediately start to do? He immediately starts to persecute Israel prior to the time of Jesus' birth. And then uh, he promulgates a bloodshed of, of Christians, uh, of killing the church. This is uh, a violent color. He has a broad sword. Now, this is a short-range weapon to be contrasted with the long-range weapon of the white horse. And it's a short-range weapon to indicate the slaughter of insurrection and civil war that follows conquest. Again, we are thinking of the horseman as a, as a causal sequence, right? Two waves of bloodshed. The first is conquest goes out and you take the territory and, and there's violence involved in that. And then you get the short range, the, the, the sword, uh, pockets of insurrection and resistance that will come after a territory is conquered, right? This is, and, and it's a sword, it's, it's, it's much more violent and uh, the kind of weapon you could use to butcher people. We could, we could look at scores and scores of military situations throughout history to show that this is a pattern. Uh, but take, for example, American combat deaths in Iraq. It was not the initial occupation of the country that was the most violent. You see here in March of 2003, 53 deaths. Look what happens once we get over a year deep, 125 deaths. The first year after the occupation, total of 353 deaths. Look at the column there, uh, like the next four rows, it's always between 700 and 800 deaths. So uh, we have two different horsemen here corresponding to two different stages of violence uh, on the military level. And that is why he has no crown, right? Remember the white horseman had a crown because uh, he's a national sovereign, right? They have no crown because these insurrections are initiated by rebels and re revolutionaries, not kings. So violence comes in two waves. The one with the crown comes and conquers and then organized resistance with their sword resists at some point, and this exacerbates the problem of violence and bloodshed. And again, we want to hear this with ancient Roman ears. It says that he takes peace from the earth. Mm -hmm. If you're in Rome or in the Roman Empire, this is part of the Roman imperial rhetoric that uh, Rome has brought peace to the world. This is their language. Uh, and, and that Rome is the eternal city and Rome has brought peace on earth. And so Revelation is going to present us with the real eternal city, New Jerusalem, not Rome, and the one who actually brings peace on the earth, the Lord Jesus Christ, not Caesar. And these two horsemen lead to this horseman. When he opened the third seal, I heard the third living creature say, come. 
and I looked and behold, a black horse. And its rider had a pair of scales in his hand. And I heard what seemed to be a voice in the midst of the four living creatures saying, a quart of wheat for a denarius, a day's wage, and three quarts of barley for a day's wage. And do not harm the oil and wine. Black signifies the sorrow and mourning caused by the famine and suffering that follow war. This is repeated in verse 12 of this same chapter, where black as sackcloth refers to the Jewish garment for mourning. Now, we don't want to mis make a mistake of literalism, because if we do, we might accuse John of making a mistake. Some people have done this. And uh, why have they done this? Well. Because in the ancient world, when you went to the marketplace, you didn't buy wheat and barley according to weight. You didn't weigh it on a scale. You bought it by volume, right? And so they're like, wait a minute. He just pronounced famine on wheat and barley, but he's holding a scale. And you don't weigh wheat and barley. You sell it by volume. Uh, but, but, but this misunderstands how complex and rich the imagery is. Throughout the Old Testament, scales is a symbol of judgment. That's why he's holding the scales primarily. He's, he's, he's trying to evoke an economic image, but also tap into this Old Testament image of judgment. Re remember, uh, you know, for example, at the party of Belshazzar in Daniel chapter 5, that a hand appears and writes on the wall, and it tells him, you've been weighed in the scales and found lacking. Also, during severe food shortages, which as we'll see in a moment, that's what this is, uh, bread was rationed by weight, right? And that's when you know a famine is bad, when, when they would stop weighing by volume, excuse me, stop selling it according to volume and start weighing their, their wheat and barley. That's a really uh, bad famine. And, 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 you know, to come at John sideways over something like this is ridiculous. He's, he's a grown man. He's been to the market many times. He knows that wheat and barley are sold by volume. How would he not know that? Of course he knows that. A day's wage for a quart of wheat meant a worker's entire earnings would be spent on necessary food with nothing left over for other needs. The prices quoted here reflect an 800% inflation in the normal cost of wheat and about a 530% increase in the normal cost of bread. So wheat is the bread that people want. Barley is kind of a poor man's bread. A quart of wheat was enough food for one person for a day. And three quarts of barley were barely enough for a small family. And there were few small families in the ancient world except among the wealthy. And, uh, you know, the prices of food fluctuated in the ancient world just as they do in the modern world. And, you know, I've read that, that the price here could, could actually be as high as 1,600% inflation, 16 times as high as the normal market price. So this is a serious family. Uh, our friend, Irvin Baxter, that I mentioned earlier with In Time Ministry, he said the Black Horseman was not famine. It's capitalism, right? Now, he's an American. He likes capitalism. If he thinks the Bible's going to talk about capitalism, well, he can't let it be a famine. He's got to make it just, he turned it into a market report. He said, you know, this much for wheat and this much for barley and hurt not uh, the oil and the wine. He goes, oh, this is like a, like, like New York stock exchange or something like that. No, these are prices of famine. Everybody knows that's not a good price for food. Okay, the thing we're going, uh, this is the line that is the most difficult to interpret in the Four Horsemen. So we'll look at a few views of this. This will take the majority of the rest of our time, but it still won't take that long. A voice comes from the throne saying, hurt not the oil and the wine. Make the wheat really expensive. Make the barley really expensive. Hurt not the oil and the wine. Well, what does that mean? Well, one, the first perspective. Some think it's a social complaint. The poor are left with nothing while the rich have as much oil and wine as they need. Uh, but this is not a good interpretation. As Osborne says, that hardly fits the context, especially with the command not to harm coming from the throne itself. Why would God decree that the rich flourish and the poor alone suffer? 
that would not be the type of judgment found in this book. To, throughout the rest of this book, it's going to tell you that the people causing most of the trouble are world leaders, military people, and rich people. So why would God send a judgment to specifically target poor people and not rich people? Like, it just makes no sense at all to me. Uh, and, and, and it also kind of misunderstands the daily ins and outs of the ancient world. It seems to assume that wheat and barley is a thing for poor people, while oil and wine is a thing for rich people. But we have evidence that even slaves consumed oil and wine on a regular basis. So this is not a good point of view. Second point of view. That it's a limited plague, right? That God is just kind of holding back. Well, how, how would this work? You know, uh, we're going to damage these crops, but not these other crops. You know, maybe God limits the famine to just one season of the year. You harvest wheat and barley in springtime. And these others are later in the year, the end of the summer, the beginning of the fall. Uh, some folks have seen it that way. A view you will find in the literature a lot because it could tie into a specific historical situation that these Christians were there to see with their own eyes is this point of view. God's sovereignty over Emperor Domitian in times of famine. Remember, this book is written in Asia Minor. It's written from the Isle of Patmos, but it's written for Christians in, in Asia Minor. It's probably written in about the year 95. Well, around 92, Emperor Domitian ordered that half of the vineyards in the province of Asia Minor be uprooted to make room to grow more grain for his armies. Eventually, wise advisors, advisors persuaded Domitian otherwise. This audience would understand that it is God who kept the famine from getting worse by his sovereign decree, not Domitian. So let's unpack this a little bit. Domitian realizes he doesn't have enough bread. Right? It's a famine. He's like, well, what am I going to do about it? We can't let this keep happening. And he says, Asia Minor, where these seven churches are, let's rip up half their vineyards and use that land to plant bread. But people in Asia Minor know that their soil is really good for grapes, but it's not good for growing bread. So thankfully, Domitian gets persuaded otherwise, and the wine is spared. So when it shows God saying, harm the bread, but not the vineyards and not the oil, not the olive trees. It's, it's a way of saying Domitian isn't really running the economy. God is. And the decision Domitian made is actually God providentially controlling things. Now, that's an attractive view because it, it's something the original audience would have seen with their own eyes. Uh, it's, it's God triumphing over the emperor. These are these are kind of leap motifs in Revelation. Uh, but one thing is it says not to hurt the olive oil. We don't know that this event involved olive trees at all. And even if there is a reference here to Domitian, as we've seen, uh, these are patterns that are supposed to characterize history, right? It's not just one event in the year 92. Last view, and the one that I think is best. The vision more probably reflects a common economic pattern. In the imperial world, a principal cause of food shortages was the earmarking of vast quantities of grain to feed the city of Rome and the armies. While throughout the empire, large areas continued to be diverted from the cultivation of cereals to the more profitable production of wine and olive oil. <coughs> so, ancient Roman Empire. you got big armies. This is how you rule the world. And you have to keep them fed. Right, so that they don't turn on you. And you also have to keep them away from the city of Rome so that they don't turn on you, right? Keep them on the frontier. Well, if the armies are not close to the city, and if Rome has a million people, which is the most populated city on the in the world at the time, well, what are you going to do if the people in the city get mad and want to kill you? They they storm the palace and kill you whenever they want to as long as enough of them want to do it, because the armies are all on the frontier. Where's your protection? Well, the way you protect yourself from the people of Rome is to keep them fed, right? So you earmark bread, especially coming out of Egypt, since that's the bread basket of the ancient world. And you send that bread to the armies on the frontier, and you have a grain dole where you distribute free bread to the citizens of Rome, to keep them fed so that they don't kill you. All right, so now you've, you've used up a lot of the bread. Well, the merchants out in the empire, 
they usually make more money selling wine and oil than bread. So they don't want to use their land to produce more bread. They want the stuff that's making them the most money. And all of these things work together to ensure that there is going to be some bread shortages from time to time. And when the ancient audience hears this black horseman, they're probably thinking of this. They're like, yeah, I've seen this, right? The military and the rich merchants, they need to get together and figure this thing out because they keep creating this bread scarcity in our cities. And of course, war would make this worse, right? This horseman is a response to the other horseman. Which leads us to the final horseman, a pale green horse. The name of the one who rode on it was Death, and Hades followed right behind. They were given authority over a fourth of the earth to kill its population with the sword, famine and disease, and by the wild animals of the earth. The color issue. So some Bibles will say that it's a pale horse. Some will say it's a pale green horse. And I'm not sure there are any that just straight up say it's a green horse. But the Greek word is chloros, right, which means green. Uh, it's the word from which, you know, English takes its word chlorophyll, which makes the plants green. When Jesus tells the people to sit down on the green grass, it's this word, chloros. So the word simply means green. So why do translators keep translating it as pell or as pell green? Well, again, it has to do with the way language is being used in the ancient world. In the ancient world, when somebody died or they got really sick, you refer to them as being green. And, you know, there's, there's, a, there's a version of this that has survived in the modern times, right? Think of zombies, always a little green, sick people. You know, we know this imagery, too. We don't commonly say, uh, uh, you know, Danielle's not going to make it to work today because she's feeling a little green. We, we don't take it that far. But they did. And so that, and, and translators know this. So even though the word is chloros, it's green, pale green or pale, seems, it tends to get what you get in your translations because the, 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 the translators, they know this is an ancient idiom. And they're trying to make sure people who read this in their English Bibles that they don't miss it. Right. So the word is green, but it probably means like a pale green, like a corpse. And it says one of the ways that death kills people is with death. You're like, well, that's that's profound. Well, again, this is ancient language, right? In the Old Testament, in the Greek translations of the Old Testament, to kill with death meant to kill uh, with disease. Uh, ancient readers might have envisioned epidemics of typhus in smallpox, which brought fevers and delirium and sores and often death. This horseman summarizes all the previous horsemen, his descriptions. His sword represents the violence of the first two horsemen. Famine represents the third horseman. And pestilence and death by wild animals is his contribution. Why death by wild animals as the final judgment coming from the four horsemen. Well, remember, it's the four living creatures in heaven that summon these four horsemen. And what did we learn about them? They're priests of the natural world. And they have many eyes and they see what the beast has done to God's creation. And it's their job to direct the worship of the animals to God's throne so that the whole natural world can worship the creator uh, through their functioning and flourishing and just simply by doing the things that they were made to do. So there's a sense in which uh, the living creatures are the Avengers who sort of strike back at those who have deteriorated the creation. And we remember that God has this on his mind too, because in chapter 11, it's going to say that God is going to destroy those who destroy the earth. And so to find that the final say, the final judgment coming from these four living creatures is animals killing people, well, that makes sense. God's enemies are introduced in the reverse order that they are destroyed. I told you a moment ago that Revelation is highly structured. So we've just met death in Hades. Later, we will meet the dragon. Then the beast and the false prophet will be introduced, and then the whore, Mystery Babylon. Well, 
they will be destroyed in the reverse order. Babylon will be dealt with, then the beast and the false prophet, then the dragon. And the last enemy of God to be defeated in this book is death in Hades. Remember what Paul says, 1 Corinthians 15, that Christ is at the right hand of God and he must continue to reign until he's put all enemies under his feet and the last enemy to be defeated is death. Interesting, we actually get a list of enemies in the book of Revelation and the last one to be defeated is death in Hades. And it says death comes out riding on the green horse, the pale green horse, whatever. And it says Hades follows behind. And we don't get much of a description about Hades. How should we imagine Hades? Well, one interpreter says Hades is seen as following behind on foot, grimly gathering up the souls of those who died from these plagues. That's a possibility. But it would seem like Hades would be riding on something because the other writers were riding upon something. But it doesn't say specifically that it's a horse. And I often think that these types of omissions are an invitation to help us speculate. So after really thinking about it, I have decided that Hades rides upon <laughs> the back of a golden retriever, second boy. And this is the true meaning of John's apocalypse. <laughs> <laughs> All right, once the tomatoes start flying, I'm done. <laughs> They're not ripe yet. <laughs> okay, I'm probably the only one who either didn't catch this or something. Um, um, last week you said that the tribulation has really gone on. It's not just seven years that it's gone on. Yeah. We've, we've all lived through it through generations. Yeah, yeah. So if that's true, where do we put these prophecies? And I mean, where do they fit yeah. in, in either the past, the present, or the future? You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, I got you. Uh, so, so that's the interesting thing, right? It's like well, Revelation presents you with two challenges. First, you have to understand what it's saying. And it's kind of really all I focus on uh, in this, these presentations. Because Could you imagine if I spent our time trying to understand what Revelation says, and then we like start trying to go through history and look at various empires and how they fell. But I have started to try to think about that. That's a... Uh, 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 a research project that has been quite important to me. And, I, and I've always thought, well, if this is initially against the Roman Empire for harming Christians, well, how did Rome fall? And the traditional answer, of course, has been because of the Visigoths and corruption in Rome. And you're like, well, where's the natural catastrophe? What's well, interesting, uh, a historian put out a book recently who, sh who showed in the decades following when Revelation was written, there were extreme extreme weather uh, in the Roman Empire because of climate change, not man-made climate change or any of that, but because these things happened from time to time, and it was in a hot cycle. And this actually introduced plague, the bubonic plague. And these plagues and these radical weather cycles actually end up precipitating the social and political conditions that made Rome weak so that armies could start attacking Rome. And of course, you have civil war uh, and these various things. So it's interesting that Revelation is saying the church is empowered to pray against these empires and these sorts of things are going to start happening. Well, in, in the case of Rome, it does happen. Uh, they A combination of natural catastrophe and <coughs> invasions and inner strife led to the fall of the empire. Now, when it comes to empires who have persecuted the church and have fallen, um, think, for example, of... Uh, the Nazi Empire, right? Uh, you know, the w one of the judgments is going to be the devastation of ships. You know, we'll see that in the time. We'll, we'll look at that again. Uh, uh, or think of uh, the Soviet Empire when it started closing seminaries and all these things, and then they had these awful famines. Uh, all these empires that have persecuted the church have fallen, and some of them in really catastrophic ways. Now, it would be work worth doing if somebody says, okay, I'm just going to look at like the 
major seven or eight anti-Christian empires and how they fall and how this connects to what the Bible says about plagues and catastrophe and all that. I don't know of anyone having done that work, uh, but but you do find when you're reading commentators on Revelation, they will like take little snapshots of history of let's let's take a look at what happened to these people who harmed the church. Is there a difference between tribulation and the great tribulation? Not at all. Uh, so. Capitalism. Yeah, yeah. So th that's that's a common thing that you'll find in like popular treatments of prophecy, right? That the final seven years is tribulation, but the final three and one half years is great tribulation, and uh, uh, that's, that's what they say. Oh. Now, uh, it's interesting that that John uses tribulation five times, and one of the times he says great tribulation, and and he's borrowing this from Daniel, right? Daniel says great tribulation. <clears throat> well. John has places, one place where he talks about the earthquake that happens at the second coming of Jesus. He says earthquake. In another place, he says a great earthquake, right? Sometimes he will add and subtract the word great because uh, he looks for a variety of language and expression. And people who are getting so hung up on words, uh, they're trying to, oh, so there's a tribulation and there's a great tribulation. No, there's no difference. And if you look at the seven years in the book of Daniel that they're talking about, in Daniel 9, it's not described as tribulation. There is no seven-year period anywhere in the Old or New Testament that is described as tribulation. There is a final three-and-one-half-year period that Daniel calls great tribulation, and then uh, John does that too. He talks about three-and-a-half-year period five times, calls it either tribulation or great tribulation. Those alterations in language don't mean anything. All right. Hopefully we didn't scare our visitors half to death. <laughs> no, I don't think so. <laughs> so would you say that the white horseman was the, um, had a net letter name for him? Uh, like a specific individual? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, so, so our, our basic views Maybe I should have listed these out, but you think about it, it's Christ or it's conquest in general, or it's the Antichrist, or it's conquest sent specifically on those who have harmed the church. And I, I think it's item number four, right? I don't think it's conquest in general. Uh, many scholars favor that. I, I think I think the evidence is stacked against them. So I don't think that we should put a specific name on it. Um, people who think it's the Antichrist do that. I actually think we're supposed to understand this as a judgment against the Antichrist empire. Uh, because uh, as we're going to see next week, these plagues are sent against the beast because he harmed the church. So to see the first seal as being the Antichrist himself, or, uh, I, I, don't, I don't think it jives with the logic that well. So no, I don't think it's a specific individual. I think that like, like the beast himself, we'll see that Nero later in the book is described as being the beast. We'll see the emperor Domitian is described as being the beast. And you end up finding that the beast is a role that keeps recurring in history. Many people are the beast until you get to the final version of the beast, the Antichrist, at the period of the second coming. No, you don't think it's the Antichrist. No. But there are a lot of good interpreters who do. But no, I, I, don't, I don't think it works. Hmm. So all of these things, like these four horsemen, whether it's uh, war or the sword or all these things, these have reoccurred in history. They're reoccurring in history. But will there be so... You know, like I grew up thinking that this was a specific time frame, and then this is going to happen, and then this is going to happen, and this is going to happen, and we're all just sitting waiting. Okay, we're at the second horse, but like, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Because, you know, there's all this happening. But that's not what you're saying at all. You're saying that this has reoccurred, but yeah. but the final one when yeah. the Antichrist is here, yeah. right before the, the the coming of Christ, yeah. that that's a different time. So there really isn't a time frame. When we are, we don't know if this is like, you know, in a year and a half Precisely. or, or if it's 30 years Precisely from now. Right. And because these things have, is that, am I in Yeah, no, you're, you're exactly right. Hence, hence the refrain many times in the New Testament that you don't know the day or the hour, right? Okay. Like, like uh, the attempts to try to distill 
exact time periods from prophecy. When prophecy, it's not just revelation. The Old Testament, it's always this way. It's cyclical. And it takes on various expressions each time it goes. This is why it was so easy for people to miss the first coming of the Messiah, right? You ever see Christians who are like, Jesus fulfilled all these prophecies. How did they miss it? You know, those stupid Jews. Well, like prophecy fulfillment can, can be very interesting in how that works. And at the time that Jesus came, people didn't have a list of agreed messianic texts. A lot of the passages that the New Testament writers say Jesus fulfilled, people didn't even know those passages were about the Messiah, right? So this is just very hard business. The hardest business you do in prophecy is, is begin to spe speculate about what historical fulfillment looks like. But to get a big in-time ministry and make lots of money, that's exactly what you have to do. And you have to do it with a lot of confidence. Like it's so frustrating because the responsible interpreters of this book are, are never going to get their voices out there. To, to overcome the podcast and the, and the YouTube and all that. So yeah, it's, it's, it's a pattern. It is cyclical. Prophecy is off, often has a spiraling effect. Each fulfillment may be bigger and grander than the previous one. And, and you should certainly expect the final generation to really see this because it's talked about Ezekiel. It's talked about in the gospels. This is just Revelation's expression of what all these other guys said too. Uh, but exact time frames. Uh, we've we've exited stage one. Now we're going to stage two, and we know this will never happen again. You know it must be in our day. Those types of uh, hasty conclusions are coming. Oh yeah, of course. I mean, and if, so they're all just interpret. So people are interpreting it as they feel that this is their interpretation. But it's, okay, gotcha. Yeah. Maybe you need to send money. <laughs> <laughs> but prior to the second coming, to, am I hearing you right that there is a singular antichrist? Yes. It's not a combination of yeah. A singular. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, yeah, it's, it's, it's so interesting that you know uh, Revelation's imagery is fluid, right? Because you'll have the beast, and the beast will be described in some passages as the whole beast empire, and other places it's just a specific king. And, and the way this comes across in Revelation 17 is so interesting because uh, it has the beast. The, the beast has seven heads, and we're told each head is a king. And then it zooms in on discussing one of the heads and then describes that head as being its own beast, right? So, so it, it's so fluid. Uh, the beast is sometimes the whole empire, and sometimes it's a specific individual. And when we get to Revelation 13, it's going to even say, count up his name. Right? It's talking about the name of a person. So, uh, so yeah, in the, in the Antichrist tradition, uh, that there will be a singular bad guy at the end, I definitely think that's valid because you can coordinate that with Daniel 11 and with Second uh, Thessalonians 2. And, and, and again, Revelation, uh, many of the passages where it discuss the beast uh, is definitely talking about a, per a specific person. Well, in chapters 13 and 17, we'll, we'll see that. All right, let's pray. I tend to see things over, overly simplistic, but could the oil and the wine not refer to the church? What do you mean not refer to the church? Don't destroy the oil and the wine. Don't destroy the church. Or is that too out of context? Well, I'll tell you this. The... Uh, I mean, in order for me to go to that, I would need other passages in Revelation that use oil and wine to describe the church. It's interesting, oil is used of spirit. Uh, uh, wine. Wine is used of the prostitute, Mr. Babylon, being drunk with the wine of her fornication. Uh, so, it's also used to symbolize the blood of Jesus. Right, yeah. Yeah, and there could be a contrast, right, as where we consume the Messiah in, in the Lord's Supper, the Eucharist, whatever your favorite language is. Uh, the prostitute is, is, is drunk with the blood of God's people. Uh, so the rest of Revelations wouldn't support. Yeah. No, I don't, I, I don't think so. Yeah. Okay. yeah. All right.